all of Scripture, but each of us is wired probably in a slightly different way, and uh, they are a genre in Scripture that we particularly love. Some of us love the poetry of the Psalms, uh, others of us, and this can be something of a reformed disease, love the Apostle Paul more than any of the other apostles, although we would argue vehemently that we are not of Paul, and uh, some of us love the narrative of the Gospels or the Old Testament histories. And the, the marvelous thing about the way in which, as Calvin says, God comes and lisps to His children, speaks their language in the Scripture, is that the Scriptures come to us in such a variety of forum in order to communicate the story of the gospel. Uh, when I was a student, my minister who made uh, such an impact on my life by God's grace, William Still, who was undoubtedly one of the most influential gospel ministers in Scotland in the second half of the 20th century, but with a wonderful touch of eccentricity, partly because he'd had no education from the age of about 14 to the age of about 26 or 27, and he was known uh, for stopping in sermons and saying, now, in order to understand this, we need to sweep through the Bible. We need to sweep through the Bible. And you knew in the next 25 minutes you'd be leafing around all over the Scriptures from Dan to Beersheba. And I recall as uh, my wife and I, or my wife-to-be and I, stood before him at our marriage service. He often closed his eyes when he spoke, a bit like Ravi Zacharias, but you need to imagine a Scottish accent. He, he closed his eyes, and uh, he began the, the wedding sermon by saying, now I want to put your two lives in context, <laughs> beginning with Adam. And he was accustomed to preaching for an hour, and uh, I wasn't accustomed to standing for an hour. But we are thinking about the church this morning, that is, the hidden story within the title this morning, The Rock. We are thinking about Christ building His church, and I want to begin with Adam. And I want to show you simply by reading three passages that the same story, the same story is first of all taught us in biblical prophecy, second, it's taught us in the movie version of apocalyptic in the book of Revelation, and it's taught to us in the historical version, in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, let me read these verses to you, first of all, from Genesis 3 and verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then what I sometimes think of as the movie version in Revelation chapter 12, where the same story is told, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon. We read later on that the dragon is the serpent of Genesis 3, grown large, a great red dragon with seven heads and seven horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to His throne. And the woman, who clearly here represents the people of God in the old and the new, the sun and the moon, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days or three and a half years or half of seven years between the first and the final coming of our Savior. And then the historical version of the same story in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told His disciples, If anyone would come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for My sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. But I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And after six days, Jesus took with Him Peter and James and John, His brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And He was transfigured before them, and His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became white as light. Our Heavenly Father, we pray as we come to You today that Jesus who is still the one true prophet, theologian, and teacher of His church, will by His holy word so instruct our minds as to enable us to grasp the glory of His work, so touch our affections that we will be drawn out in wonder and love and praise, and so make our wills malleable that we may bow before Him as our Lord and Master and serve Him with all our strength. And this we pray together in His great name. 
Well, I want you to keep your Bibles open here at Matthew chapter 16. It is, in very many senses, the center point of the story of the Synoptic Gospels, the first three Gospels. It is the hinge on which the whole narrative of the gospel turns, as Jesus is not only confessed by Simon Peter to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, but as we are told in Matthew in 1621, from this particular time, the Lord Jesus began the more plainly to unfold to His disciples what it meant that He was the Christ and therefore what the implications would be for the church that He, Jesus Christ, had come to build. When we read the narrative passages, particularly in the New Testament, one of the things that we should always be asking is this very simple question, what is there here that surprises me? What is there here that surprises me? I say that because in its very essence, the grace of Jesus Christ is surprising for sinners. And so, simply as a basic principle of my Bible reading and certainly of my Bible teaching, uh, when you and I read a passage of Scripture, if we find nothing surprising in it, we've probably missed the point. We have probably developed a perspective in which we assume grace to be obligated to us, have become so familiar with a false Christ of our own creation that we haven't yet reckoned with the real Christ of the gospel narrative. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that there are many surprising things in this passage. Actually, the first surprising thing is that Simon Peter gets it right. That's a surprise. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. You are right, Simon Peter. The second surprise is this, and I think it makes no difference in terms of your narrower view of what Jesus is saying here, there is no doubt whatsoever on the surface of this text that the Lord Jesus is appointing Simon Peter to a particular role in redemptive history. And in fact, the rest of the New Testament makes that clear. Peter is not only the first disciple mentioned in the list of twelve, he's always the first disciple mentioned in the list of three, and he is the one transformed for the day of Pentecost who opens the kingdom of heaven to those who repent and believe the gospel. Indeed, what Jesus says here about Simon Peter is almost a direct parallel to what the Lord says about the Apostle Paul when the Apostle Paul is converted. He says, this is the man through whom the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. He is going to stand before princes, kings, and governors. He is given a special role in redemptive history, just as those of us who are ministers of the gospel are given a special role in the life of our individual Christian fellowship. There is nothing extraordinary about that, except it's utterly surprising that that role is given to Simon Peter. He is the one apostle we have thus far met in the gospel who has an apparently untamed ability to get things wrong. And it is part of the wonder of what our Lord Jesus is saying here that we will miss if we get ourselves into a fankle about later controversies about the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. We will absolutely miss the point if we don't see that our Lord Jesus is so sovereign so surprising in grace that it's Peter that he chooses to be the instrument through whom the gospel is going to be proclaimed to the world on the day of Pentecost. 
The third thing that's surprising, of course, and this was the thing that really surprised Simon Peter, took his breath away. The surprising thing is the destiny of our dear Lord Jesus, the one who has come into the world to save sinners who will be rejected and despised, not just by sinners, but by religious sinners, not just by political leaders, but by the leaders of His own nation, that John's words will be fulfilled, that He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. That's a surprise that should give us an ache in our stomach. And the fourth surprise, the fourth surprise is that Peter, who got it so surprisingly right, now gets it so disastrously wrong. And we have these words that we can scarcely take in in verse 22. Uh, If I can retranslate them, Peter manhandled Jesus and said to Him, rebuking Him. Manhandles physically, rebukes verbally, and then in this astonishing oxymoron, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you, Lord. And yet, perhaps the most surprising thing of all is that in this great central passage in the Gospels, with the exception of chapter 18, verse 17, where the word is used twice, this is the only reference in the Gospels to the church. You can search high and low through all your Gospels Go to your car in which you keep your Strong's Concordance if you're one of the strong, or Young's Concordance if you're one of the young, or as Mr. Still used to say to me, Cruden's Concordance if you're one of the crude. (laughs) And uh, you'll not find another reference to the church in the teachings of our Lord Jesus. And that is perhaps the most surprising thing of all, that he apparently says virtually nothing about the church, and yet the Scriptures from beginning Genesis 3.15 to the end in Revelation 12 and way beyond at the end of the book of Revelation make it so crystal clear as I think so many of us, if not all of us in this room this morning, have grasped that the church stands at the epicenter of the purposes of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you step back from these words, you have a sense that there is uh, what I sometimes call a programmatic ring to them. Jesus is making a kingly declaration this is the reason I have come into the world. This is the purpose of my ministry. This is actually why I am going to the cross and why I will rise again and establish my kingdom, because my central purpose is not simply to bring the forgiveness of sins to individuals, regeneration, new life, and adoption. My purpose is to build a church and so to build a church that not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against it. So, I think it's important as we think about these verses for a few minutes that we try and bring out from them the four central propositions that they are teaching us. The first is this, as I've already hinted, that Christ's central plan in His coming is to build a church, and this stands at the very heart of His ministry. A hundred years ago, there was a great controversy uh, in New Testament scholarship. Uh, Roman Catholic scholars who were studying the Scriptures, some of them were excommunicated. One of them, a man called Alfred Loisy, a Frenchman, who made a famous statement about how you read the Gospels. Jesus taught the kingdom of God, but it was the church that came. 
And you can understand why he would say something like this. What is at the apparent center of Jesus' teaching? It is his teaching in parable and in sermon and in a variety of ways that he has come to establish the kingdom of God. And uh, this is the reason why many New Testament scholars would look at a statement like this and say, this is something the church thought up after Jesus had risen. If Jesus' real purpose was to build the church, then it would be all over the gospel story. But there's a very clear reason why the word church is not all over the gospel story, why the word kingdom is all over the gospel story, because it is only when Jesus brings in His royal reign, and especially only in the manner in which He brings in His royal reign, which of course His disciples absolutely misunderstood, that it would even be possible for there to be a new community possible for that new community to be built and shaped in the precise way that the Lord Jesus intended it to be built and shaped, or if I can put it simply, and we will return to this, only when the King has been crucified do we begin to understand what kind of church He plans to build. Otherwise, we are in the situation of Simon Peter saying to Jesus, build your church, but don't go to the cross. And it's so evident, isn't it, in this passage that the cross and the resurrection are so central to Jesus' life and to our life that we can never understand this passage, Jesus' teaching about the church, Genesis 3.15 or Revelation 12 apart from seeing how our Lord's prophetic words here come to fulfillment in His death and resurrection. But actually, it's very clear elsewhere in the Gospels that Jesus came to build the church. He may not use that terminology or the gospel writers as they recall the teaching of Jesus, but when you think of the teaching of Jesus about what He has come to do, the gospel story is sprinkled, baptized even, with pictures that are communal pictures that make it clear that Jesus has not simply come to call isolated individuals to Himself, but there is an undergirding principle in this that as He calls us individually to Himself, we inevitably are drawn closer to one another. I think of the simple picture of the shepherd and the sheep. The sheep hear His voice. They recognize His voice. He calls them by name. What do they do? They come closer to the shepherd, and what happens as they are gathered closer to the shepherd is that inevitably… Now, I'm sure there are some sheep that are more smelly than others. I'm sure there are sheep with such idiosyncratic characteristics that other sheep would rather be at the other side of the flock, but it's the same in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be called to Jesus Christ without being called into the fellowship of His people. And so as Jesus, and this is striking in Luke's version of the gospel at the same point as Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration has a conversation with Moses and Elijah about the exodus He is going to accomplish in Jerusalem, the exodus of Egypt comes to its fulfillment in the exodus of Calvary and the garden tomb emptied. And in that fulfillment, God is saying, not now to Pharaoh, but to, as Calvin says, Satan, our Pharaoh, who holds us in bondage, let my people go that they may worship and serve me. And this is what Jesus is announcing here in this programmatic statement that He makes, that at the very heart of His purpose in coming into the world 
is His purpose to build a community. That's why when Luke describes the vitality of the first Christian church in Jerusalem, the way he describes what happens there is that the Lord adds daily to the church those who are being saved. It isn't that you add to the church. Oh, yes, now I'm saved. I think I should add myself to the church. No, you don't understand what happened to you when you were saved in that sense. What the Lord Jesus was doing was plucking you from the community of darkness to which you by nature belonged and bringing you into this new community of the church. We've so much lost that sense today, haven't we, in our profoundly individualistic and narcissistic society? Really, one of the subtle ways in which you see that, I think, is in our Bible study groups. I think Alistair Begg referred to our Bible study groups yesterday. And we sit in our Bible study groups, and then the, the very helpful leader says to us at the end of the Bible study, perhaps we've been studying one of Paul's letters, uh, he or she says at the end of the Bible study, now what are you going to take home from this? And we sit round and we say, well, the passage has said this to me, and the passage has said this to me. And you know the thing that we don't notice? Almost every single second person in Paul's letters, that's the word you, is plural. And you know you're in a Bible study group or a church that has got the teaching of Paul when instead of saying, what's the takeaway from, for me at the end of our little Bible study, we're actually looking around the room and saying to each other, now, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to help one another in this? So, you see, the New Testament's perspective is not that Jesus has come to save a number of isolated individuals and we thought it might be quite a nice thing if we could get together from time to time. We need to understand that the sickness in the human race is far deeper than what has happened to isolated individuals. It is systemic. It is familial. And what Jesus Christ has come to do is to reverse all of that in the wonder of the gospel of His saving grace. And this is such a glorious time in history to understand this. This is something that will stop me from becoming a complaining, moaning willy as a Christian in the world, and understand that in the midst of all the fragmentation of life there is around me, which I lament and over which we weep, the church of Jesus Christ has a singular opportunity really to be the church. You know, we live in a day when I became a Christian, if you used the word born again, everybody knew what you were talking about. You'd come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now the place where you're most likely to see that kind of language is in the sports section of the of the newspapers, and it may not refer to anything particularly Christian or religious. But somebody's had a broken leg, and now he's born again, or somebody made a mess of it with one team, and now he's born again, and he's got a new start. What we need to understand is that we are born into families. And in this world of social, familial disintegration, you know, people do say to us in this postmodern world, I'm glad that your Christian faith has made you happy. But this has made me happy. So we're both happy. Do you know the one thing the world cannot imitate is a church? A church I used to serve in Glasgow, I'll never forget. I returned a year later because I was in Scotland, and uh, uh, I was able to go to the funeral service of a dear elder, wonderful Christian missionary whose whole family had been a blessing to me, and sat in the back of the church, and this woman came into the church whom, 
who had been a, a valiant soldier for Jesus Christ in very difficult circumstances, a very modest background. And as I, as I saw her walking down the aisle, I realized only one seat in the place she could sit in, and it happened to be beside the one man in the congregation who had been knighted by Her Majesty the Queen. And I watched her sit down beside Sir, and she turned and put her arms round him and gave him a great Glasgow smacker on the cheek. Now, I don't know what his wife on the other side was thinking, but do you know what I was thinking? Where in all the world are you going to see this today? This is why we love the church of Jesus Christ, and this is His vision. His plan to build the church stands at the heart of His ministry. And the reason is He wants to create a new family that will stand out, that will make people young and old have this sense of, I don't understand it, but I see that's what life was meant to be, and it creates longings within me. And then through our testimony, they are brought to a living faith as God's grace runs through the dried-up riverbeds of our lives. But you know, it's not only the family on earth that's been fractured. There has been a fracturing between the family in heaven and on earth. Remember how Paul speaks both to the Ephesians and the Colossians about Jesus Christ reconciling under His one headship things in heaven and things on earth. Well, there's nothing in heaven that needs to be reconciled to God. It's a world of sinlessness. It's where the saints of God live and they sin no more, where the elect angels praise God and cherubim and seraphim surround His throne. But what Jesus Christ has done wonder upon wonder is to bring together the family branch on earth and those amazing cousins in heaven and unite us together in a holy fellowship that will last for all eternity so that when we worship together and as if we are older, we will sometimes say, although usually we're not allowed to sing any longer, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That's not just wishful thinking. That's the privilege of belonging to the church that is on earth, that has been united with the branch that is in heaven. So, Jesus is here declaring a cosmic plan that He has to build His church. Second proposition is this, and this is so important, and we find it from Genesis to Revelation. Our Lord Jesus Christ plans to build His church on enemy-occupied territory. He plans to build His church on enemy-occupied territory. I will build my church, he says in verse 18, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, there is a view among the scholars that there was some ghastly cave at Caesarea Philippi that was popularly known as the gates of hell. But it's clear, isn't it? Jesus is not saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start the first Presbyterian church of the gates of hell here in Caesarea Philippi. If indeed there was such a cave, he's using it as a metaphor that he finds already in Scripture for this great conflict of the ages that was announced in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent seeking to destroy the seed of the woman, and the one great seed of the woman coming to crush the head of the serpent himself, and in the process have his own heel crushed. It's a, it's a fore picture of the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and what lies, interestingly, at the epicenter of the first promise of salvation. It's not a promise of the forgiveness of sins, although there is that sense in Genesis 3.15. It's a promise 
of victory over the gates of hell and death and the evil one and the ransoming of God's people and the creation of this new glorious family whose head is the seed of the woman. But you know, this expression, gates, is significant in Scripture, isn't it? Usually when it's used, it's a physical picture of a political reality. For example, the, the wonderful woman in Proverbs 31 that all of you ladies, you want that passage read at your funeral. Um, and what's so great about you? Your husband is known at the gates. Does that mean you fell out and everybody knew you'd fallen out because you stuck him out? Or he was an inveterate smoker and you said, you're not smoking in this house? And he was, no, no. It means he was known among the elders. Think about what Boaz does when he wants to marry Ruth. He goes to the city gates. The city gates represent both the security and the political strategy of the community. I think about the Ten Commandments. You're to care for the stranger who is within your gates, who is within the little fiefdom. It's not just every Englishman's home is his castle. Every Israelite's home was his castle, his territory. He was a miniature king in his own family. And so, the gates are uh, a metaphor for the center of strategic operations. And so, you see the picture that Jesus is building? I will build my church. That is the epicenter of my strategic operations. It's through that strategy center that I'm going to reach the world with the gospel but I am going to build my church in a context where there is another strategic center of operations, the kingdom of darkness and hell, the plan of the serpent to bruise, crush the heel of the Savior, the constant affliction that the seed of the serpent will bring to bear upon the seed of the woman and it's the story of the Bible in a nutshell from Genesis 3 right through to this point. And it's actually a wonderful little clue to being able to understand the Bible as a whole. Sometimes philosophers say that the history of Western philosophy is just a footnote to the writings, the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle. And I think we can say the story of the Bible is a series of footnotes to Genesis 3.15. That's what the Tower of Babel is all about. It's about the seed of the serpent seeking to destroy the testimony of the seed of the woman. That's what the conflict between Pharaoh and Moses is all about. It's not merely horizontal. This is what David and Goliath is really all about. This is what Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar is all about. This is what the gospel story is all about. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, building His church and doing so on enemy-occupied territory that constantly fights against it, seeks to do battle. The apostles saw that that was the meaning of the second psalm. I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill, and here are the powers of this world as ambassadors of the kingdom of darkness and the gates of Hades, and they say, let us tear off our bands, let us break them asunder, let us fight against the Lord and His anointed very words that are taken up, aren't they, in Revelation chapter 12, that He set His King on Zion, His holy hill, and He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Therefore, you nations, tremble, kiss the Son, that you may live. It's the story of the Bible. The church is built on enemy-occupied territory. It's the story of Revelation chapter 12. 
It's the story of the infant Jesus and King Herod seeking to devour the Christ child, his father protecting him. And so the serpent now grown into this ugly, ferocious red dragon, dragon, he now pursues the woman into the desert. It's where we're living. We're living in this three and a half years between the first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord, and the dragon will spew out all his filth, but the Lord will protect His people. That's the story that Jesus is telling. Now, what's the implication of that? My dear friends, the implication of that is that if you are a Christian and part of a church, you must never be surprised if things go wrong. You must never be surprised if there are the attacks of hell against your church. You must never allow yourself to be the kind of evangelical who says, this kind of thing doesn't happen in a church like ours. Because if that's what you say, you're purely horizontal in thinking about the church. You're really thinking about who we are. We're evangelicals after all, and we get things right, and we know how to do things. No, we're under hellish attack. That's the truth. You remember how Paul puts this so beautifully in Ephesians, in the bookends of Ephesians? Have you ever noticed this? He begins by saying, now, beloved, what has happened to you is that you have been brought into heavenly places where you experience every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And then at the end, at the bookend in the great section on spiritual armor and warfare, he says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but about pr against principalities and powers. Where are they located? In the heavenly places. The very place into which you are brought in the life of the church, about which Ephesians is to say so much, is a conflict zone. As Abraham Kuyper says, if somebody could just draw back the curtain and we could see that conflict, every other conflict in human history, the kind of conflict in which our nation and nations involved today would seem like a murmur in comparison. It's interesting, isn't it? We get far more excited about human conflict at the horizontal level and of very little interest in wearing the armor of God and taking all prayer, fighting the good fight of faith. So the church stands at the center of Christ's purposes. Christ plans to build His church on enemy-occupied territory, and we've got a microcosmic picture of the church here. Just in passing, let me say, that all of these words really have a fulfillment in the story in the Acts of the Apostles, don't they? Peter preaching the gospel, opening the kingdom of God, but also the gates of hell seeking to destroy the church. And if you work your way through the opening chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, you will notice that Satan has three weapons he characteristically uses. The first is intimidation, which in the case of the early church was physical intimidation of persecution. That's a weapon Satan uses. But now sometimes it comes from within the church. Whenever you encounter Mr. or Mrs., Master or Miss Intimidator in your church, and he could be in the pulpit, he could be on the elder board, he could be sitting beside you in the pew, you might be married to him. Mr. or Mrs. Intimidator is by definition doing the work of the evil one. And many a church has been destroyed by Mr. or Mrs. or Miss Intimidator, who from their lofty position of spiritual superiority has that ability to make everyone else feel inferior. You know the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus? He made everyone feel a sinner, but He never made anyone feel inferior, did He? You're that kind of person. 
a reformed intimidator. God save us from you in that case. You need to repent. How dare I say this? Because Jesus said to Simon Peter, whom he loved with all his heart, you need to get behind me because you are advancing the works of the gates of hell and not of the kingdom of God. There is intimidation. And then, of course, there's false ambition. Ananias and Sapphira, false ambition wanting to rise to positions in the church for which God has never gifted you, jealousy of others. And then, of course, there is the complaining that creates division. So, it doesn't seem all that supernatural, does it? It's just the intimidating personality. He just said, you know, I'd really like that people thought more highly of me than they really should think. I'm right to murmur and complain about this, like the Israelites in the desert. We had leeks and melons when we were in Egypt, and now we all get these quail and this manna. God deliver us from the moaners that destroy the atmosphere of the grace of the gospel. The third proposition is this. Christ builds His church through servants who are marked by great frailty. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's not beautiful that I've said it that way. The thing itself is beautiful, isn't it? That, you know, the angels, what are the angels thinking? I think they're thinking this, Jesus, why are you starting with plan R? Whatever happened to plan A, we're waiting here. Hey, Jesus, we are here. In myriads, we are here to help you build the church. How can He possibly be choosing Peter? Well, because he's the sovereign Savior, and because He delights to do things in such a way that no flesh will glory in His presence, that all the honor and praise will be His. And so He says, I think he, my own view is He is actually saying this to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Wow! As Calvin says, the surprise here is that Christ will build His church on the basis of this mess? Yes! He'll build His church on the basis of a 5,000 people mess. At the end of the day, we're all basket cases. <laughs> and the great thing is that He draws us together. And in Peter's case, because he is called to be a minister of the gospel, he puts the keys into his hands. Hey. Actually, this is a text in Scripture that teaches us that automobile manufacturers should always make automobiles that have keys. I'm only joking. That's not a good interpretation of that text. He's not giving him authority of a papal variety. He's saying to him, Peter doesn't understand this, but he's going to remember it on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit comes and as they step out and all the other guys are staring at him saying, say something to the crowd. And then it's as though he hears the voice of Jesus from heaven saying to him, Peter, the keys are in your pocket. The keys are in your pocket. And he brings them out. And this man who so little understood the Scriptures gives the most amazing, redemptive, historical, uh, applicatory, experiential sermon that had ever been preached, and thousands are brought to faith. Because as Paul says, this is the way you should think about Peter and Apollos and myself. We're simply stewards and God has put the keys into our pockets, and He means to use us for His glory. And then the fourth proposition, and with this we close. The first is that building the church is at the heart of Christ's ministry. 
the second that Christ always builds His church on enemy-occupied territory, the third that He builds His church through servants marked by great frailty, and the fourth that He always builds His church on the ground plan of His own destiny. That's why He immediately begins to teach them that He's going to the cross, He's going to die, and He's going to rise again. And if anyone is going to follow Him, then He will need to take up His cross and follow Him, because if you seek to save your life, you will lose it, and only if you're prepared to lose your life will you save it. Only when the church becomes a seed that falls into the ground and dies will it bear much fruit but you will see the Son of Man coming in His glory. And some of them get a glimpse of that immediately in that marvelous transfiguration scene. What's He saying? This is actually the reason ancient architects built church buildings in the form of a cross. It wasn't because they lived in a day of poverty when ladies couldn't afford the gold to hang the cross round their necks. They understood the cross was never meant to be a decoration. The cross was ever meant to be the ground plan of the Christian life, so that the way in which the church is fruitful is when the church is squeezed into the mold of, as Paul says, sharing in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings in order that it may share in the fellowship of His resurrection, being conformed to Him in His death, in order that ultimately it may be conformed to Him in the triumph of His life and His resurrection. So that when Paul says, not just about himself, but about all those who belong to Christ, the pattern is this, 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12. Death works in us in order that life may work in others. We are crushed, we are broken, but through our crushed, broken lives, the glory of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ shines. Men and women are brought to faith in Him. Some of you know Calvin's great teaching on this in the third book of the Institutes, where he says there is an internal and an external mortification and vivification. There is a death to sin, and there is a spiritual resurrection to newness of life. But in the church of Jesus Christ, there is also a share externally in the suffering, in the pain, in the agony of the cross, in being demeaned and afflicted and despised, because it's when we are squeezed into the mold of the cross that we become the kind of fellowship, the cross-shaped fellowship, the cross-bearing fellowship through which our Lord Jesus Christ bears eternal fruit. Wherever there is new life, there has been a death somewhere, and we need to learn to be churches prepared to die to this world and in this world with Christ if we long to be churches that will live. Many of us love the writings of C.S. Lewis, although he's not the greatest theological guide, but most of you know that uh, C.S. Lewis said, basically, all of my good thoughts come from the Scotsman, George MacDonald. Not because he was a Scotsman or his name was MacDonald, a name that's familiar to you in this country. Um, and in, in one of his tales, one of his tales, this is George and not Ronald, incidentally. In one of his tales, the central figure comes and he meets the old man of the earth and uh, the old man of the earth points him in the way to new life, to fullness of life, and he, he points down this dark hole, and the, the hero in the tale looks down, and uh, the old man of the earth says, you must go down there. And the hero says, but there are no stairs. 
And the old man of the earth says, no, there are no stairs. You must throw yourself in. And if you stand aloof, he says, if you stand aloof, you will be dead as long as you refuse to die. That was the message of Luther about the church, wasn't it? We don't want to die. We want the theology of glory. Why do people not recognize how majestic the Reformed church is? They should recognize how majestic the Reformed church is. No, I'm just refusing to die. And so long as I refuse to die, and my church refuses to die to the things of this world, life will never be ours. Well, there's so much more to say. That's actually just the beginning, but time has gone. Let me finish with this word. The Lord Jesus Christ loved the church and gave Himself for the church. So let us, Jesus-like, love our church and give ourselves for our church. Heavenly Father, thank You for the grand design of the gospel and for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to respond individually to this Word, but also as a community of friends who have been bound together by Your Spirit in these days. And as later today we leave and go back to our own place of worship and service, we pray it may be filled with Your Spirit, humbled under Your Word, with renewed servant desires to love and serve the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray this in His name. Amen.